good morning, everybody. Um, happy to be talking to you again, um, this time uh, about um, a second passion of mine beyond we're countering organized crime, um, the rule of law. And my job, um, I think, uh, is to sort of set the stage um, conceptually, theoretically, and um, I'll start giving some examples, but I know Martha has many more for you um, as our second speaker. Um, so if we could go to my first slide. Um, I've been asked to talk about the concept of the rule of law and how it relates to these other issues we'll be talking about this morning, civil military relations and democratic and civilian forms of governance of the security sector in Africa. Um, so the question is, how does, what is rule of law and how does it relate to these other concepts that could be useful to you as strategic leaders trying to improve the delivery of safety and security to citizens on the continent? So I'll begin by saying I'm starting from the point of the rule of law because it's key. It's a principle and a practice that is key to forging healthy civil military relations. It is also a principle and a practice that is key to ensuring that the governance of the security sector in your countries happens in a way that ensures that indeed security as a public good is being delivered to citizens in a way that is accountable to their needs and the country's national security. So, in other words, rule of law is an underlying element of both good security sector governance and healthy civil military relations. So it's important to understand a bit more in depth as a principle and as a process. So very briefly, you can see some of the key um, elements here on the slide. In terms of principles, you all probably already know this. Um, rule of law is the idea that all people are treated equally under the law, regardless of who they are. So that contrasts with this concept of rule by law which is a mode of governing in which those who are in political power use the law maybe to constrain others, but not necessarily themselves or the people who are affiliated with them. So um, in terms of process, I think this is even more important to understand as a process than it's just a principle. Um, rule of law is not just about security and justice officials enforcing the law on the books. Rule of law is about making the equality of everyone under the law a real tangible thing. So in that sense, building the rule of law is an ongoing social and political process. It involves the state, including the security services, and it involves citizens. It hinges upon the state officials in that relationship, working to forge relationships of trust and reciprocity with citizens. And that would be on the basis of a variety of local, national, and international standards about the rules of the game, whose rights, uh, what rights are, and what forms of redress people have when they have disputes. So in other words, ensuring the equality of everyone under the law in practice, not just in principle, is a core part of governments establishing and maintaining that social contract with citizens that we were talking about last week. Um, next slide. Um, I've got a couple of different sample definitions from the UN, from the o Mo Ibrahim Foundation, from the World Justice Project, if you want to look at how the, these definitions are operationalized in different contexts um, academically. Um, in terms of key principles behind rule of law, when we're talking about rule of law, we are referring to about six different things, different qualities of this concept. One, countries with robust rule of laws and policy, have laws and policies that are clear, they're well known, and they're internally consistent, okay? okay. Um, so that means um, that's sometimes referred to as legal certainty. It's this idea that you can anticipate what the consequences of any given behavior might be as long as you understand what the Constitution and the law says. So in this sense, transparency about the law and how it's applied is an important part of this concept and this practice. Now, the content of the laws also matters, of course. And countries that have a robust rule of law frequently have constitutions and legislation that offer equal protection of freedoms and liberties for all citizens. There's also an element of proportionality to the law, i.e. the degree of punishment being appropriate to fit the crime. Um, some African countries have ratified international conventions that affirm some of these principles. There's also the African Charter on Human and People's Rights that many of your countries have signed on to. And then there is the African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Governance 
that promotes rule of law principles like equality in the exercise of various freedoms and liberties. In addition, when we think about the rule of law, citizens' practical access to state and non-state options for justice are also part of having a robust rule of law. Do you have different elements at your disposal that you can use to resolve disputes or solve problems that you are having as a citizen? So ideally, every citizen would have a range of justice options that they can choose to use if they encounter a problem, and they have good knowledge of the pros and cons of using different options, state courts, mediation, customary authorities, etc. And finally, the extent to which justice institutions operate fairly and independently also matters for whether there is a robust rule of law. So you have checks and balances between the executive branch, the legislature, the judiciary. Um, and again, um, these are ideas that have a lot of uptake internationally, but um, there is also African precedent for all of this in things like the AU Agenda 2063, which is further advancing this vision. Um, so um, that's a bit on the rule of law. If we could go to the next slide, I want to link rule of law as a principle and a practice to two other important things that we're talking about today that you need to have mastery of as emerging leaders. And one is security sector governance, and the other is civil military relations. So let me start with security sector governance, which you can see a definition of in this slide. Um, good security sector governance is a term of art in this subfield, and this refers to the practice of ensuring that the security sector is held to the same high standards of public service delivery as any other public sector service provider. Um, so it's hinging on the principle of accountable civilian control of the security sector. That in and of itself is rooted in this idea of the rule of law. So as you can see up here, the seven core principles in green, um, a good security sector governance process, defense and security services are held to clear standards in their provision of people-centered security, so we have clear expectations. People of various genders, ages, parts of society, geographies, and sectors are consulted when defense and security policies and strategies are being created. A range of oversight institutions that may be internal and external to the defense and security services themselves are actively involved in regulating security policy and provision, once again, in accordance with the rule of law. And there's independent information available about the quality of services being provided. Finally, um, if we have a process in which we have sound um, security sector governance, there are also plans to manage security resources in a coordinated and capable manner. And just to remind you, we have panels about security resource management, the strategy elements of this coming up for you tomorrow. So we'll be able to go into those in greater detail soon. To give you an example um, of a country where when you listen to some of their officials, um, from within oversight institutions within the defense forces describe their governance process for the security sector. Um, I have heard this well articulated from some of our colleagues um, we've worked with in Zambia before. So in Zambia, for example, um, some of these elements you see in green are definitely in place. Some of the key institutions you see in orange on this slide are also heavily involved in checking and balancing one another and working collaboratively together to ensure that security is provided effectively as a public good. So in Zambia, during the consideration of the appropriations bill for defense each year, the Zambian parliament debates the security sector budget, just like any other sectoral budget would be debated in the assembly. Uh, the proposed budget allocations are made known in a yellow book. So there's a, literally a yellow book that's distributed to all ministries in Zambia. And the idea is that this book is distributed so that the information about allocations is openly available to people who are part of the oversight process. For defense procurement, a very sensitive area for everybody, um, for us here as well in the US, since these procurements are related to providing security, a public good. Procurements are subject to an open tendering process in which contracts in Zambia are approved by the Ministry of Justice and are tracked by the internal audit wings in the country. So independent appraisal units that exist within different ministries during the implementation of the spending for those defense contracts. An internal audit report 
goes to the Parliament's Public Accounts Committee. Parliament is then authorized to conduct outreach to the defense and security sector to provide oversight about how the money in the security budget has been spent and whether those open tendering procurement procedures have been followed. And then law enforcement agencies in the Anti-Corruption Commission, civil society organizations, get reports from them to follow up on any breach of the law that might have occurred during the process. And again, all of this is in service of the elected officials that the people have chosen being sort of intermediaries with the security sector to ensure sound provision of this public good. So you can see, if you look at the key institutions here in orange, good security sector governance that fits within the framework of the rule of law involves a wide variety of different institutions in state and society and across different branches of government. And Sean's telling me I've got probably four minutes now, so we need to go to civil military relations. We'll have more of a chance to discuss this in the afternoon as well, and I think through Martha's um, presentation and Sean's moderation here. Um, but briefly, um, here are some basics on civil military relations. Again, rule of law and constitutionalism are at the core of a healthy civil military relationship, which you see pictured in that triangle. Um, often, CMR is also discussed as a situation of nested delegation, and that's pictured on the right, um, the diagram with all of these arrows. And again, you see citizens working through civilian government who delegates to the military the provision of security as a public good. The military is then accountable through oversight to the civilian government, who is then accountable through elections to citizens. So that's the basic idea of healthy CMR. As Sean mentioned, Colonel McClure, in his intro, the military is subordinate to civilian authority through constitutional and legal mechanisms. This respect for the system is further inculcated through a strong culture of security sector professionalism and a culture of civilian professional development and proficiency about the defense and security sector. And the expectation in healthy CMR is that uh, the military provides expert advice while knowing that even if they think they're more informed in their area of expertise than these civilian leaders, their advice is not binding for the civilian authorities who were elected by the people and therefore have the political mandate to make policy decisions that will shape how security and safety are delivered as a public good. But when an ideal balance is struck in this triangle, um, the military shares its relevant expert advice it is well resourced and well positioned enough through the civilian government's decisions to protect the people and the country, but the military um, is not so powerful that it can use its resources and its expertise in an unchecked way to go where the civilian government leaders don't want to go. Um, I think if you look at our ESSL website from last year, um, we have an interesting um, dialogue and talk from General Dan Kowali um, from the Malawi Defense Forces. And he also has talked about how this model of healthy civil military relations is also rooted in the rule of law and related to sound governance of the security sector because of the different accountability mechanisms that are embedded in here. You have vertical accountability between citizens and the government. You have horizontal accountability between different government institutions and civilians delegating provision of security to the military. You have the military being accountable to inspectorates in the executive branch, as we described in Zambia. They're accountable to defense committees and parliament. They're accountable actually also to constitutional courts, which are always looking at whether the exercise of military power falls within the remit of the law in ordinary times and under states of emergency in extraordinary times. We also have diagonal accountability, civil society and the media infusing into these relationships of CMR more information and more forums for digestion of the uh, different elements of this policy relationship. Um, I know that um, at the Malawi Defense College, um, they're building up um, some additional modules on the rule of law and security sector governance and its relationships to um, the civil military relations curriculum that already exists in many PME institutions. Um, and PME institutions, I will also note, 
play an important role in reinforcing these accountability relationships, not only by teaching those in the military um, how to be professionals, but also by opening opportunities at these institutions for key civilian leaders who are on the other side um, of the arrows here, who are on different vertices of the triangle here, um, to themselves develop more proficiency and experience working with their military and security sector counterparts. So for example, at the Nigeria National Defense College, there is a Department of Governance and Public Policy that is in the habit of teaching uh, their students about legislative oversight, and broader civilian control over the security sector um, and the cordial relationship between the NDC, key members of the National Assembly and others allows for senior officers on the civilian side who are at the director rank to study at the National Defense College. And so I think um, this makes PME institutions and um, those who are trained throughout their careers in what makes for a healthy civil military relationship these institutions are really important not only for military professionalism, but also for building up civilian knowledge and professionalism. I think because I'm being told my time is up um, and we need to um, move to Martha's talk as well, I will perhaps leave it there, having given you a few examples um, of what's going on in different African countries in relation to these different concepts, how they're being operationalized. You saw in Zambia, in Malawi, in Nigeria, um, as you know from General Diop's speech and probably from following the news, I think Senegal stands out as another country where we see a healthy civil military relationship um, uh, having prevailed uh, in particular recently um, in 2024 during, during the election period. I think that is another excellent example of one other key principle of CMR, which is remaining outside of partisan politics, party politics is key for security sector officials. Um, I think the Senegalese Armed Forces did um, quite a nuanced job of that um, during uh, the, the controversies in 2024. At the same time, this does not mean that as a professional in the security sector, you shouldn't be savvy about how the political process and the policymaking process works and what the consequences of your actions um, as a professional may be.